Hi everyone, this is Laura Hammock from the Marble Jar channel, and in today's video I'll share some of my takeaways and a summary from the paradigm-shifting book, The Righteous Mind, by moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt. So very occasionally I read a book that changes the way that I view the world. I read quite a bit and I'm highly influenceable, but there are really only a handful of books that have changed the filter through which I see things. These are some of those books. Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, is one of those paradigm shifting books for me. It helps that I read this book at a time when I was puzzling over the polarization of our political discourse. So I am a dyed in the wool liberal, but I enjoy talking to people with all different views and not just to yell at them that they're wrong. I like to hear why people think what they think. So I grew up in a very conservative town and I have a lot of friends of very different political persuasions. Some of my very favorite people vote differently than I do. Underneath it all, we all seem to love our families, care about our friends, value hard work, and want to make our communities and our country better. Why do we seem to have such different solutions? Why do some people's solutions seem to me to be unkind and oppressive when I don't think of those people as unkind or oppressive people? And why do we seem to be talking in different languages or sometimes having completely different conversations? So here's an example of what I'm talking about. The controversy over NFL players kneeling during the anthem. One side is talking about police brutality. The other is talking about honoring our veterans. How can we possibly come to any shared conclusions when we seem to be having totally different conversations and arguing about completely different things? And how is it that two people can take such different meanings away from the same action? So the righteous mind actually answers this question for me, but let's come back to this example later. If I haven't made it clear yet, I highly recommend this book. It's interesting, it has great examples, it's well argued and structured. The book is split into three parts and Haidt presents a different theory in each part. So the first part of the book presents the theory that when it comes to moral decision making, so that's making decisions about matters of right and wrong, we tend to decide based on gut instinct and then we rationalize those decisions post hoc or later. In fact, Haidt argues that our entire reasoning process evolved not to find the truth, but instead to convince others that we are right. So he uses this metaphor of a rider on an elephant. The elephant is our intuitive reasoning. So that is the mostly subconscious automatic processes that drive most of our behavior. The rider is our reasoning and is basically just along for the ride. When you feel a flash of negative feeling, that is your elephant. Sometimes your rider can wrest decision making away from the elephant, but rarely. Mostly our reasoning just rationalize the decisions that the elephant has already made. Kind of like, um, like a spokesperson frantically explaining the mouthing off of an erratic politician. And sometimes we can't even think of any explanations, but we still stand by our intuitive choices. So this is called moral dumbfounding, and it is quite common once you start looking for it. Apparently, the higher your IQ, the more arguments that you can generate on the side your elephant is already leaning towards. But higher IQ doesn't necessarily mean that you get any closer to the truth. So for the purposes of this video, I would like you to notice any flashes of negativity that you feel. If you are a liberal, you may feel some while you're watching this. And then continue listening to see if your rider can ultimately influence your elephant. So the second part of the book is the media's part. It talks about Haidt's moral foundation theory. The first important point that he makes is that based on personality, people are predisposed to be either conservative or liberal. It has to do with the trait of openness. So liberals tend to be more taken with variety, diversity, and new experiences. Conservatives tend to prefer order, routine, and tradition. It's not a given, but political preference is driven at least in part by personality. So he identifies six cross-cultural moral foundations. You could call them moral values or categories. Liberals tend to see two or three of these. Conservatives see all six. In fact, when conservatives were asked to fill out a questionnaire as though they were liberal, they did pretty well. When liberals were asked to do the same thing, they totally bombed. They can't even pretend to understand how conservatives think. If you are a liberal, did your elephant just wake up and give you a little flash of negative emotion? Well, hear me out. So Haidt's view is that these foundations are like moral taste buds. Some people have a wide palate, some people have a more narrow palate. So I like to think of them as controls on the equalizer of an old audio system. Some are turned way up, some are turned down. 
So here are the three moral foundations that liberals can see in order of importance. First, the care harm foundation. So this is basic liberal doctrine. Be kind to others, be altruistic, the golden rule, reduce suffering. When we see kids suffering, we feel the flash of moral anger and revulsion. The next one is liberty oppression. So this is our natural reaction against bullies and tyrants. It's equality, but against those who would dominate or oppress you or others. When we see people in shackles or enslaved, this moral instinct kicks in. And the third is fairness cheating. So this foundation is about reaping what you sow. It's the guard against freeloaders and cheaters. It's not straight egalitarianism, but what Haidt calls proportionate fairness. In other words, the moral sense that people should be rewarded for their good deeds and that cheaters should be punished. Karma and just world stuff. Okay, so those are the three moral foundations that everyone can see. Here are the ones that only conservatives see. Loyalty, betrayal. So this is the degree to which you can trust others. It's our response to people who might not be considered team players. We want to reward those who honor the group and ostracize those who don't. Breaches in loyalty are met with moral, moral outrage. Next, authority subversion. So this is the response to those who step out of understood social hierarchies. Living in a social group usually means adhering to some kind of social structure. And we can be very morally sensitive to people who behave in ways that conflict with their rank or their status. And finally, sanctity degradation. So this is anything that triggers a purity or sacred reflex. This comes from our species' evolutionary need to avoid pathogens or contaminated foods and is generalized in modern life to special items that can be considered sacred or worthy of reverence, like the nation's flag or certain monuments, buildings, or documents. So this is the tendency to feel moral outrage when those sacred items are desecrated or pure things are made impure. So those last three generally strike liberals as not just not moral categories, but actually not desirable at all. After all, in the name of lo loyalty, authority, and sanctity, people have oppressed and harmed others for millennia. But here's the thing, we are weird. And I mean that as the acronym. So most folks watching this video are from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic countries, weird. Most moral studies have been done in weird countries, but if you do cross-cultural investigations, weird countries are statistical outliers, and here's why. Those countries tend to value individual contributions, whereas many other countries value the contributions of the collective. So the three moral foundations held by most liberals, care, liberty, and fairness, are based on individual rights that have been held up as sacred since the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. They are important to protect individuals from harm and oppression and are enshrined in our nation's declaration of independence as unalienable rights. So the last three moral foundations, loyalty, authority, and sanctity, are collective binding tools. They help create and maintain tight cohesion within a group, and they help to ensure that if your group faces attack, that you will be able to fend it off. All you need to do is remember how we all felt, if you're this old, after 9-11. Fiercely American, groupish, flying our country's symbols with gusto, and ready to follow orders into battle. We were also ready to give up some individual rights in order to protect our group, and we did so with the Patriot, Patriot Act. In fact, people tend to feel more strongly about loyalty, authority, and sanctity when their group is under threat, since cohesion is particularly important in those times. Which brings us to Haidt's last point, which is that humans are 90% chimp and 10% bee. What he means by this is that humans are mostly selfish. They have evolved to procure and protect resources for themselves and their progeny, the chimp analogy. But he argues on behalf of multi-layer or group selection as well, which must be a controversial position considering the amount of time and energy that he expends on this. He convinced me human groups needed to survive and succeed in an environment of competition among other groups for limited resources. The groups that were the most cohesive were the most successful in obtaining life-preserving resources, and then they passed those groupish traits down to future generations. This is the bee analogy. Bees are hierarchical, they have division of labor, and they are cooperative and altruistic within the context of their hive. Our 10% bee behavior accounts for group-based altruism and cooperation. So, why was this book so eye-opening for me? It helps me to understand why people think what they think. For example, 
I find this puzzling. Why do some conservatives want to limit access to birth control for women? So using only the three moral foundations that I'm used to seeing, this seems oppressive and harmful. But if you consider that conservatives are trying to preserve a way of life where the family was the main social unit and the roles of each person within that unit were well-defined, then limiting birth control makes sense in the context of preserving the hierarchy and the order of the family unit. It's hell for individual women in many ways, but that was considered justifiable collateral damage to protect the collective family unit. So I'm not arguing that this is right, but the logic makes a tiny bit more sense. Or how about gun control? Liberals argue the care harm principle. It's gut-wrenching to see people dying in our schools, public places, and in the context of domestic, domestic violence. But conservatives are arguing from a liberty oppression standpoint. So these are two different moral arguments. It's just a matter of which matters more to you. So you can basically do this for any issue where the parties seem to be talking against each other. Kneeling during the anthem is police brutality, which is care harm, versus disrespecting our troops and the sanctity of the anthem, the authority, sanctity, loyalty, triumvirate. Immigration is care harm versus sanctity and proportionate fairness. Now, I'm not saying that all of these are equally defensible positions. I'm just saying that it helps me to understand why people come to the conclusions they do and why evolutionarily these moral foundations exist within us as humans. It helps as a liber liberal to know that too much emphasis on individuality tends to tear at the fabric of group cohesiveness. And for a, from a conservative perspective, too much emphasis on collective morality tends to oppress and harm some individuals for the potential benefit of the group as a whole. I loved this book. Please read it. Maybe we'll all be able to understand each other's moral languages a bit better and work together to widen our understanding of who is worthy of cooperation and altruism. Let me know what you think. Comments are always appreciated and thanks for watching.